What in the world does hip hop have to do with theology? What does abortion have to do with church ministry or hip hop at all? And East Coast or West Coast? We'll get into all this in this episode of Church Entrepreneurs today with our special guest, Timothy Brindle. Let's get this. David and Goliath is a familiar Bible story, but most Sunday school lessons still apply it poorly. What's the way that most preachers and teachers apply this? David's our example when he defeated Goliath. And by faith in God, we can beat all our giants like our fears or anxieties that's inside us. But that would be a mend in a synagogue. So in the song, I'm going to show you what's about the Son of God. It's better than the moralistic. Welcome to Church Producers Podcast. My name is Richard Moore. I'm your host host and informant for everything church, theology, and faith related. Churchpreneur's vision is to accelerate the church in mission, vision, and effectiveness in fulfilling the Great Commission in our communities. Churchpreneur's hopes to embolden people to fulfill the Great Commission beyond their own borders into the rest of the world in this generation. It's possible, folks. In this podcast, I talk about everything that's moving me in relation to church, and theology, hopefully to empower you in your ministry, church, Bible study, theological understanding, and most importantly, your personal growth in Christ. What up, church entrepreneurs? We've got a sweet show lined up for you today. That song you were just listening to is Head Crusher from our special guest, Timothy Brindle. We're going to hear some more of his music throughout the show today. Uh, Now, not only is Tim a rapper, uh, he holds a Master's of Theology and a Master's of Divinity from Westminster Theological Seminary. He's a pastor, theologian, author, husband, and father of nine. Uh, One baby daughter has uh, gone on to be with Jesus. Um, He's also a hip-hop artist and senior advancement officer at Westminster Theological Seminary, as you guys heard in his song. And that's right. I said hip-hop and Westminster Theological Seminary in one sentence. You liked that, didn't you? Um, He's currently working on his Ph.D., under uh, in Old Testament at Westminster under uh, Dr. Jonathan Gibson. Hopefully, he'll tell us a little bit about that today. We're very excited to welcome him today to share with us. Welcome to Church Entrepreneurs. Tim, thanks for taking the time to bless us today, bro, out of your busy schedule. We really appreciate it. Richard, I'm honored to be on your wonderful show and podcast, and I praise God for your ministry. So thank you for having me. Yeah, bro. Let's jump right in. So glad to have you, man. Um, Let's do this. Uh, Before we get into the deep weeds, as it were, right? Let's uh, let's just lay out a, a, your history, man, and your your uh, your hip hop history, discography. Just tell us uh, some of the, the albums you've had and uh, where we you know we can go get those on on wherever we listen to stuff. So lay out that for us. Where what are all your albums and your hip hop uh, history? And and I want people to go grab your music. So if you don't mind doing that for me, absolutely. Thank you. Well, the Lord was gracious to allow me to begin doing hip hop, even as a non-Christian, allowed me to tone my craft, as it were, in high school and in college, so that when he saved me, um, I had already been uh, writing and performing uh, and recording um, hip hop music for several years. And so the first album after my new birth, after coming to Christ, was about the new birth called The Great Awakening. Yes, sir. Uh, which was released in 2003. Then 2005, an album called Killing Sin. Um, and that was really all about the way that Christ, by his spirit, empowers Christians uh, to put sin to death, as we're commanded to in Romans 8, uh, 12 and 13. Uh, and then the Restoration album, uh, followed by The Collective, along with Zay the Blacksmith and Stephen the Levite, uh, the, yeah, the, the trio of us, the collective. Uh, that project funded a European mission trip, and it also provided songs for us to perform while we were doing that mission trip all throughout Europe. Uh, following that was the unfolding, uh, the, a double album uh, with, an, uh, with a book that goes along with it. And the unfolding is really my, my magnum opus. There you uh, go. That's right. That <laughs> seeks to show how uh, God's one unfolding story of redemption is all about Jesus Christ. 
And then more recently, a couple of singles, The Interpreter with Masum Fenya from Malawi. Uh, and Do You Really Love Life? Uh, yeah, bro. He, Masum Fenya is from Malawi. Was he speaking? What was he? I need to, I need to, y'all help me out with that, bro. He, yeah. He's speaking Malawian or what is his language yes. there? The language there is Chuchewa, which is a dialect that is spoken in Malawi and some other uh, Southern and Southeastern African countries. And so the idea of that song is uh, he would interpret or translate what I said and I uh, into Chuchewa and I would interpret and translate from Chuchewa to English what he said. And yet the theme was how uh, Christ is the interpreter of scripture. Yeah. The spirit enables us to interpret the Bible um, uh, in, it, in its main focus is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. So. Bro, you 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 blew my mind as well with that one line that uh, uh, the Pentecost is the reversal of Babel, bro. Yes, so nice. So you got to go get that music. And then, uh, do you really love life? Did you mention that yet? I didn't. Do you really love life? Was the most recent single. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, released right around Christmas time, uh, in honor of the fact that God the Son uh, became a a fetus in the womb. And so uh, that song featuring Alyssa Wade. Um, was uh, is the most recent single and people can find all of my albums um, in the unfolding book uh, on timothy brindle ministries.com timothy brindle ministries.com right. we'll make sure to highlight that again in the end but yeah uh go i mean the the unfolding like you said the magnus opus uh we uh, as a family we rocked that all the time and actually, I do a carpool. It's just a, a hit. I put on uh, the unfolding. And so uh, another kid in my, my son's class, he was like, bro, what is this? <laughs> so he was loving it. So German, though? Or no, was... no. Actually, oh, okay. he goes to a, a dual, a, a multilingual school. So this guy's an English, uh, English kid, actually. So, nice. um, bro, we need to get you back over here, too. Um, you were over here with the collective that 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 album funded that your mission trip here. So, bro, when we could we get you back over? Anyways, it, yeah. it'd be an honor. And you know, I am German uh, and yeah. English, Scottish, uh, Polish, and mostly Irish. Uh, and my wife is from uh, the country of Angola. Her yeah. family. Um, and so, but it'd be a blessing to come to to Germany. I ha we didn't make it to Germany. We were in England, Amsterdam, Poland, and France. Yeah. Uh, and so it would be awesome to come uh, to D D Deutschland. That's right, bro. You need to come back and re reform the reformed, you know, like, bro. Um, yeah. So the land of the Reformation needs uh, the Semper. Re exactly. I saw you wearing that shirt, bro. So, um, yeah. So let's jump right into this, man. Uh, Timothy, tell us how did you come to faith in Christ? Uh, how did you get into hip hop? You mentioned that a little bit. And maybe just tell us the circumstances that kind of led you to keep rapping as a Christian and using this art form for kingdom purposes. It's a great question, Richard. The Lord saved me uh, a week before 9-11, uh, 2001. Um, but I began doing hip hop in high school and uh, growing up in urban Pittsburgh, being surrounded by hip hop culture uh, and especially influenced by East Coast underground uh, battle rap, uh, hip hop that was uh, very much emphasizing uh, punchlines, wordplay, yeah. uh, in-depth lyrics. Um, and so these were the things that were influencing me that I was in love with. And I was uh, just surrounded by friends who also started rhyming, uh, freestyling and battling um, so this was about 1996, 1997. And so by 98, 99, uh, we began recording and putting out some music. And so I chose to go to Temple University in Philadelphia uh, because, you know, being in Pittsburgh and being familiar with the underground hip hop scene there, I was aware of an uh, even more prolific underground hip hop scene in um, Philadelphia. And so my primary motive as a, as a non-Christian to go to Temple University was just to be immersed in the underground hip hop scene in Philly. And I was, right. and, and um, sort of formed a new crew, a new group, along with the verbal tech and dose noun, we were called the parts of speech, we put out um, some 
an EP, uh, a full length album, a 12 inch record. And then boom, the Lord interrupted all that with salvation by his sovereign grace. Um, what wow. he used in particular was a relationship with a girl. She started going to church and I eventually just wanted to impress her. <laughs> uh, and God used that. And yet when I showed up at church, she wasn't there. That's the first God, time the that's Lord ever was. happened, right? Like, yeah, no one ever has ever tried to go to youth group or church to uh, impress a girl. <laughs> Yeah. How about that? So bro? I had purchased a Bible, Richard, um, you know, to play the part at church. And so um, while I was sitting in the back, feeling very awkward, I started reading the Gospel of Luke. Uh, my, my, my father named my brother Luke. I knew he was named after the Gospel of Luke. Yeah. And that week, I just couldn't put down the book of Luke, Richard, seeing Christ's wow. miracles, seeing his compassion for prostitutes, demon-possessed people, the blind, uh, those with leprosy. And it was quite clear, I was all of those people. And I needed this all powerful, all compassionate Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave me new birth reading his word. That's and that's not the first time that's ever happened either, right? <laughs> God, wow, look at so so you're reading Luke, you picked up Luke and God opened your eyes and then and then sort of took you on this journey, right of of like, wait, so I'm a Christian now, but I do this art form called hip hop. Um, how can God use that? So, you know, so let's talk about theological hip hop. Um, started getting deeper in your faith, I, I take it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you said, well, wait a minute. Um, this not just how do I plumb the depths of the riches of the grace of God, right? And so you started doing that in your music. So let's talk about this theological uh, idea of theological hip hop. Describe your vision to preach the scriptures through hip hop. Well, you know, it was quite uh, a conundrum. Or I was in quite a pickle, um, <laughs> a really difficult predicament when I first got saved uh, because I was a part of a group where our lyrics were quite blasphemous, very overtly uh, graphic and vulgar, mm -hmm. uh, even though intellectual and, and, and witty and clever. Um, you know, when you're, your whole purpose is to uh, glorify self and basically over against yeah. another uh, rapper, MC especially in, in battle and battle rap, right. you know, I mean, you're trying to just exactly. slam your the guy, opposition. Right. You're right. And lift yourself up above them. Yeah. You're eventually going to get to the point of comparing yourself to God or as one who's greater than God. Um, and that's what we did. And so when the Lord saved me, I'm in this group. We have all these lyrics. We, we have these projects. We had shows lined up, you right. know, and I ended up doing one or two more concerts uh, within that first month of my of my uh, new life in Christ. And instead of coming off stage with this high and, and feeling like I was on top of the world after just killing it and crushing it <laughs> because I'm so dope. Yes, instead, so dope. <laughs> it was, I grieved the Lord. I can tell wow. his spirit is grieved. Um, and by God's goodness and providence and grace and through the faithful teaching of his word and the proclamation of the gospel and faithful Christian discipleship, um, he began to renew my mind so that you know, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And mm -hmm. as he renewed my mind, um, this gave a passion to make Christ known through hip hop. And then really realized that hip hop is a very ideal medium to teach the truth of the scriptures, to teach uh, the, the truth of our salvation um, in, in, in Christ. And in particular, to unpack reformed theology mm -hmm. uh, in, 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 a, in a didactic teaching sense. So, yeah, that's something that the Lord did in that first year of my new life in Christ. Um, and so after about nine to 12 months of discipleship, sitting under Christ-centered preaching and teaching, yeah. the Great Awakening album began kind of writing itself. Um, and yeah. by the following year, uh, it, it was released. Uh, and so the, the Lord kind of took it from there, Richard. Right now, now this is the challenge, right? You know, with, with hip hop, you know, the kind of the conception is like that battle rap and, and, you know, you're just trying to slam your opponent, 
so you can you diss him you do whatever you can you find you look at his hat you try to see like oh he, he's whack bro you know and and just trying to like one up right and so how does things like that and then also just like mainstream hip-hop how can how do we redeem that how is that redeemed for the lord and you know, like even, you know, I, this kid, I, I stuck the CD in or, you know, put, put my phone in. Right. And we're listening to your work and there and hip hop just speaks somehow. Right. It just has that that sort of that universal. So how to kind of kind of walk us through that. The God for you as well, uh, redeeming that art form sort of. Yes, I think it is especially uh, puzzling to us, Richard. Um, for those of us who are aware of how wicked uh, a lot of hip hop is and how hip hop has been used to glorify self yeah. um, and to um, a as a vehicle for sin. And so it could seem very strange that hip hop can be injected or instilled with Christ centered God glorifying yeah. content. But if we step back and if we even think about scripture in the old testament the lord has been the ultimate battle rapper if you will the lord through his prophets who by the way used rhyme wordplay yeah. parallelism and poetry all yeah. kind of imagery um and in other poetic devices the the prophets in particular really went out of their way to diss and slam uh, and make fun of the idols, the false gods. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, I love uh, on the Mount Mount Carmel, right? You know, is your God like using the restroom? Maybe. I mean, that's the nice exactly. way to say it, right? <laughs> right. Yo, Elijah is straight dissing Baal. You know, um, and so there are aspects in battle hip hop that, like you said, are not only redeemable. Uh, but battle hip hop is actually borrowing from the Lord. Uh, and if you think of the Psalms, and this is one of the wonderful topics that I've been studying with Dr. Jonathan Gibson at Westminster in the PhD program, oh, Hebrew yeah. poetry. Mm -hmm. my, my dissertation is on the Psalm of Jonah, Jonah chapter two, um, which is a Psalm and the Jonah's use of the Psalms. Wow. And so Jonathan Gibson, just he has an amazing PhD class called Discourse Analysis of Hebrew Poetry. And you look very carefully at the, at the meter in, yeah. in, the, in, in the Psalms and, and in Hebrew poetry, that is the rhythm. You know, uh, you look at uh, syllabification, yeah. there's syllables and yeah. there's a lot of rhyme. There's all kind of assonance using yeah. uh, vowels um, in all kind of wordplay, right. all kinds of, of chiastic uh, structure and patterns. Bro, the, the, the psalmists and, and the other uh, inspired Hebrew poets, these guys were, were, for lack of better words, they were lyrical theologians. Yeah. They were using uh, poetry and, and, and words to unpack the glory of God unfolding in salvation history yeah. leading up to the coming of Christ. And oftentimes in doing so, um, showing the, the supremacy of Yahweh, the God of mm -hmm. Israel, oh, the true and living God over against false gods. But then a, another thing that comes to mind, Richard, is the way that various uh, psalms mention the instruments that the song is to be sung in, 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 mm -hmm. in the first verse. Yeah, yeah. In Interesting. Yep. Yep. And oftentimes, Richard, or to those the tune of this thing or that thing. Exactly. exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so some of those instruments are actually from the pagan or the heathen nations. And so you get the sense that at times David is using instruments uh, from the, the idolatrous pagan nations uh, around Israel, but he's using those instruments to worship Yahweh. And so another way to put it is the, the treasure or the plunder uh, of the Egyptians is stored up for the righteous. <laughs> Turn this joint up, Joe. Come on. That's crazy, bro. Yeah. Rowdy. Behold the waters of judgment from Yahweh, the living God. That's right. Who judges his enemies with the waters of judgment uh -huh. as he saves his people through the waters of death. Baptism. 
Yeah. Now let's do a biblical theology of water judgment. Check it out now. Rowdy. Yeah. So, um, you know, and we get back to, you know, in Christian history, right? Uh, I think of the most current thing, Bill Gaither and all these these folks who would say that drum beats and this and that, the other thing are wicked or evil. Um, those things belong to the Lord. Amen. That's cool. Right. I mean, those things belong to the Lord. The enemy has used them and usurped them for his wicked purposes. And and he has. Now, we, we got to admit that. Right. I mean, hip hop has been. Um, but let's move to your lyrics. Your lyrics are so deep and rich. Try to help us. Give us an idea of what your creative percolating process looks like. What how do you write and create? And especially with, uh, you know, uh, that, that big, long uh, uh, magnum opus, right? Uh, how did you create in that process? Give us a glimpse if you can. Absolutely. You know, Richard, for me, oftentimes um, the writing process is it, it begins with a brainstorming of yeah. ideas which become rhyme schemes on a piece of paper that looks very, very confusing and chaotic <laughs> unless you're Timothy Brindle. Um, and so nice. sometimes it's, okay, here are the three main points, sort of like a sermon, um, or here are at least some of the main points or ideas, maybe not even in rhyme form yet, but as I write that down, and I, I really like writing by hand. Um, I still haven't really got into writing by you know, typing yeah, yeah. on my phone yet, it, you know, writing by hand. We're old school, um, bro. Yes, exactly. Pen and pad. That's right. <laughs> there you go. Taking those ideas and begin yeah. to putting them, begin putting them into rhyme scheme, rhyme schemes, rhyme patterns. Um, and some of the strongest lines where you set it up with um, a few words and then boom, you, you have your punchline. That's yeah. all stuff I learned how to do as a battle rapper. I'm where tracking you, where your yep. last line is the, you know, is the, <laughs> is the right hook, bro. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Okay. So uh, let's jump into some, we're going to uh, springboard from one of your songs. Uh, you've given us permission to have a look at this song into the, one of the next topics we want to discuss, which is abortion. So do you really love life is a bit of a testimony. Uh, maybe I guess from you and, 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 and maybe a, a amalgamation, it seems like to call the church to engage in the issue of abortion or, or life and to really love life and embrace women who might be caught in unplanned pregnancies. Um, I see this as like a clarion call. I, I hope this is so well and, and sp broadly heard by the church as a song uh, to get involved. Um, so, bro, bro, I'm, I'm like listening to it. The first time I heard it, like in tears, bro. This for me is a life issue. It's personal. My daughter uh, was born with Down syndrome. And uh, more children, I mean, children are pre prenatal tested. And for the most part, those children are aborted. And that just hurts my soul, bro. So tell us the story of that song for you. What inspired it? And maybe if you're willing, tell us the story of, of, of your wife and, and, and her background. Absolutely. Well, Richard, I have to uh, just praise the Lord for Pastor Brian Ottinger. Pastor okay. Brian, um, he serves with uh, Love Life Ministries, mm -hmm. which came out of Charlotte, North Carolina. And there are Love Life chapters all over uh, the country, and they continue to spread. Uh, but Pastor Brian and I go back some time now uh, through the Christian hip hop scene. But he brought me to Charlotte about two years ago to do an outreach and preach at his church, nice. do an open air outreach. But he took me to a Love Life event, which is their normal event on a Saturday, where they set up a stage next to the Planned Parenthood in Charlotte. They actually purchased the plot of land next to the Planned Parenthood in Charlotte. And on that plot of land, they set up a stage, they got a sound system, a handful of pastors from different churches, different denominations who all agreed to the essentials of, of the faith. Yeah. They, they share the word, they sing to Christ and they worship and they all pray and about yeah. 50 to 300, maybe even more 
uh, people show up at, at these events, crying out to the Lord, praising Christ, but also interceding for the Planned Parenthood. Mm. And then there's a team of folks who go right in front of the Planned Parenthood, and they're seeking to winsomely, boldly, but compassionately yeah. turn away the woman and sometimes yeah. men with the woman, but usually women by themselves who are going into the Planned Parenthood who are about to, to kill their children. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes they succeed. Um, and, Side, and sometimes, sidewalk counselors, basically. Yeah. I've done well that said. when I was in high school, we went to every Saturday, went to a, 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 a abortion clinic and, and did sidewalk counseling and prayer. And it's done so compassionately by some people. Some people do it wrong. But some people can do it so compassionately. And I was just been unfortunate to be involved in those things when I was in high school. But yeah, that's excellent, Richard. Very in that same vein that you did it. Uh, I, I think love life is faithful. Um, and, and so experiencing that was really striking to me. But then Pastor Brian, a, 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 you know, last year, he said, Tim, would you make a song for love life ministries to use? And I said, I'd, nice. I'd love to, I'd love nice. to. And as I continued to, you know, talk with my wife and, and study mm -hmm. abortion more and more and more study, not only the statistics of abortion and study the way that the children are aborted, but yeah. bro, when I went into Psalm 139, because I wasn't sure exactly how I was going to write the song. Um, but through my Bible reading and one of the ways I, that God helps me stay on top of my, my Hebrew is to each morning read a Psalm in Hebrew. If I'm not nice. taking a turn in the new Testament and, and trying to stay on top of my Greek reading Psalm 139 in the Hebrew text floored me with the way that. All right. Now, now wait a minute. No, Go no ahead. spoilers. Cause we're going to do no the song, bro. Right. I, I know where you're going. So don't no spoilers, but yeah. um, I, I, the, you gotta, you gotta, I, I understand exactly what you're talking about. You gotta look yes. at the original languages and uh, it just floored you. So that's right. And I wept Richard at the way I've been desensitized to abortion. Mm. And we got to be honest with ourselves, man. There's such a, a, um, a, a common slaughter in great numbers of, of, of the unborn. Uh, we've become used to it. Yeah. We've just become used to it. And even some of us have thought, well, you know, political government right. officials, they can't really change this. Oh, well, let's yeah. get on to real justice issues. Um, and so I, I had to repent for the way that I myself thought I just took abortion very lightly. And this was in writing that song, yeah. Brother Richard, to answer your question. So let, let me jump in there with the slaughter thing, right? I mean, you, it's I'll give the perspective to it real quick. I just looked, went and looked at the numbers. 2,400 babies are aborted in the U.S. daily. 891,000 abortions took place in 2019. Let that percolate in your soul a little bit. 891,000 eternal souls in the image of God that we've snuffed out. So... Bro, I'd love to jump in. Can I? Can we? T can we listen to your song and review it together? I've wanted to do a review of this song forever uh, since I first heard it. So, I, spoiler alert: I've heard it. But let me just share the screen and let's let's just do a reaction, quick reaction uh, together of it, if you don't mind, huh? And then we can uh, uh, go from there and then and then talk about this issue. So here we are. Can you see that? Yes, sir. All right, here we go. So, Timothy Brindles, do you really love life? with Elisa Wade. She's got a great voice, by the way. So she let's does, get man. into it, man. Let's go. Get this. Timothy Brindle on the scene. Here we go. I am a fetus being created by Jesus, fearfully and wonderfully made a Oh, wait a minute. I got to stop it right there. I am a fetus created by Jesus. If he's the creator, bro, then he's the creator, right? That's right. 
Sorry. Ace at this genius. My brain with its pieces in my face with its features are being stitched together like they've been made by a seamstress. In my mother's womb, I'm being woven together, spilling over from his joy, the overflow of his pleasure. Intricately weaving me, it has me baffled. That's the same word for the embroidering of the veil in the tabernacle. Yeah. All right, that's the same word for the. Uh, now you blew my mind just then. I, um, I did not know that, and I love Psalm one thirty nine. I mean, I guess I got to brush up on my Hebrew, bro. <laughs> tell it. Do you know bro, that word? Can you can you tell yeah, us that? Yeah, I hadn't seen it before either myself, um, brother Richard, and it's a very it's a rare verb. Are you breaking out um, your Hebrew already? Look at that. Got to, got to, got to. <laughs> yes. yes. It's a very rare verb. Uh, the verb rakam in the pu'al stem uh, means to uh, be skillfully wrought, to be sown. And it's also found in Exodus uh, 26, 36 for the tabernacle veil, for the instructions of the tabernacle veil. Uh, and so remember the Lord filled these artists with the spirit yep, yep, in yep. order to skillfully construct the tabernacle those are the first spirit filled people bro it's crazy man and and yet that's the in, in intricacy uh, that's used to describe the way that the lord formed and stitched and knit together uh like you said a, a child in the image of god in the womb we're his crazy. needlework bro mm. Yeah, I saw my embryo tendons grow, go. then my tiny ten fingers grow, then my toes, ten of those. Your presence is all around, it's all profound. You see me in my mommy's womb before she had an ultrasound. You planned my birth, I am your handiwork, the same hands who made the expanse in the planet Earth. You've begun my little tongue to give abundance of praise. Your love is displayed and how I'm wonderfully made. At the moment of conception, you've begun my soul. Psalm 139, 14, this word for wonderful is the one place in scripture where the naturals described as supernatural because this act of crafting me so masterful do you see this glory that's revealed uh -huh. by the lord feeding me from my mother from my umbilical cord i can't wait for the sight to see her face in the light but wait now mommy's contemplating taking my life oh man that's the punchline now my mommy's come to contemplating taking my life How can we mess? How can we mess with the needlework, bro? What brings us to this, oh, right? Man. Yeah, man. You know, um, there's an amazing t-shirt that Wrath and Grace made. I'm just gonna grab it real quick. Right oh, here. look at him. He's got he's got stuff with. I love it. So this is, and I think it's somewhat of an answer to the question. The original planned parenthood. And you see an Israelite is offering up their child to there at the top Molech. To, to Molech. And so you, I think it's safe to say that the reason we, that we as humans do this is in our sinful worship of maybe not Molech, but the God of self. Um, and you know, and when I, I I'm, I'd love to get into my wife's testimony and share yeah. um, why she why she uh, took her child, um, which God in His grace used that to save her, and now has given us nine children. But yeah, great bro, question. let's let's get this story. This so now you jumped into the story on the song. So let's let's get this story. This is Pam from Planned Parenthood. Hi, ma'am, I'm pregnant and I didn't plan very good. I fear what will be said to me. My peers, they will be dreading. How is Planned Parenthood still in existence, bro, after all their scandal and stuff? Sorry, you, you jump, you know, I didn't plan very good, etc. <sighs> Anyways, let's keep going. I will appear pathetically. My whole career is ahead of me. Yes, you want to go to college and grow in knowledge. But if you have this baby, then all your hopes demolished. But I'm nervous that it's murder and I'll pay for this. Then she gave me assurance. My insurance will pay for this. Besides, it's my rights. It's my life. I'm right. I won't regret this decision in hindsight. Sacrifice my life. No, I can't afford to give it. 
give it. So now I'm here at the abortion clinic. Who's this crowd wearing love life t-shirts in action? Their knee jerk reaction is teamwork, compassion. Oh, a there woman step forward. Life, yeah. She first was asking, will you love life or be a pre-birth assassin? Satan tried to kill baby Jesus, but he escaped to Egypt. So on the cross, he'd be slain to pieces. To Bro, he dropped the heat. Um, we're going to get into that. But, um, yeah, there were some people in the womb who were very important key figures in the scriptures, right? Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, you dropped that heat. Let's keep going. Pay for our sins, then he was raised to free us. So I fell on my knees in my life I gave to Jesus. Then she embraced me as I screamed, Jesus, save me. By your redeeming grace, I choose to keep this baby. Then she embraced me as I screamed, Jesus, save me. By your redeeming grace, I choose to keep this baby. Wow. By your redeeming grace, I choose to keep this baby. So the story goes, the sidewalk counselor, yeah, um, helps this woman come to terms and say, like, I want to receive Christ, man. Look at me. I'm in a mess, bro. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm caught in sin. Um, and uh, just like the woman who was caught in sin, Lord, the Lord said, go and sin no more. Don't, 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 you know, multiply, right, the sin. Keep this baby. And by the grace of the Lord, here's what happens. Now I'm a grown man, 20 years later. Like mom who taught me the word, I've trusted Christ as my savior. Though she chose my birth, some moments she grown with hurt. But we were surrounded with love and help from our local church. They gave a baby shower. The savior strength and power gave all sufficient grace in every single painful hour. They discipled my mother. Dad was not around, but they embraced her as sister. And in Christ, I'm the brother. It's plain to see her pregnancy left a legacy. For the praise of the alpha and omega, the A to Z. Now we stand with love life outside Planned Parenthood To declare that the God man's very good We see a young mother's face sad with contortion She has come to this place to have an abortion Miss inside they will destroy your little boy I say young lady only Jesus can fill your void I Sacrifice my life no I can't afford to give it My only choice is right here at the abortion clinic Don't sacrifice this life at the abortion clinic Accept the sacrifice of Christ your life the Lord will fix it don't sacrifice this life at the abortion clinic Accept the sacrifice of Christ New life the Lord will give it She was moved by his love and by her love for each other She, she chose to keep her child And then was hugged by my mother We have to We have to put flesh on these stories, right? Mm. Right? These yeah. are people, man Right And and I know I know people who that, that's happened to, right? That, that God chose to keep a child and and the child did something, became a pastor. This flip in this one, this story where the, the son becomes a part of kingdom mm. ministry and saving other babies, man, that's, did that really happen? Is that a real story or is that just a, sort of a construct? Yes, it is based on real testimonies from Love Life. And in particular, yeah. Pastor Brian Ottinger is the one who really helped me um, with uh, the flow of the three verses. In other words, nice. I had already begun writing the first verse, speaking in the first person as the fetus in the womb, as right. David speaks in the first person in Psalm 139, of course, as an adult there when he's writing. But I really wanted to bring, uh, bring out the force and the weight of, um, this is a person speaking here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but my plan, and I actually had a few rhymes ready, um, this is before recording, my plan was for the child to be killed, for the abortion oh. to happen, for people to really feel wow. the weight of it. And Pastor Brian was like, bro, that's not a bad idea, but what if you did this? <laughs> what if, you know, based on, you know, these various testimonies and these stories, stories and things yeah. that he's experienced as... Um, uh, a minister of the gospel with with uh, love life. What yeah. if the mom chooses to keep her child? 
Right. And then what if her and her child that she kept uh, grow up and actually minister to others as a testimony of God's grace? And so in that regard, it's somewhat similar to my wife's story, who, um, although she um, had an abortion, um, and after having as a non Christian when she was 19 and was suicidal, she was going to kill herself. Um, and yet someone shared Christ with her and she prayed, Lord, make my womb, which I've made into a tomb, make mm. it a place of life again. Mm. Um, and not only has God answered that, but my wife is a trained um, biblical counselor um, through an abortion ministry that seeks to, uh, wow. not an abortion ministry, a, a Christian gospel ministry that seeks to yeah. turn women away from having abortions, or if they've had an abortion, um, counsel them in the gospel uh, um, called yeah. Amnion Pregnancy Center here wow. in, the, in the Philadelphia area. And so, so bro, do Pierce, you really love do you love life? And so, and I got, I have to say, I got all up in my feelings, bro. <laughs> because uh, when we were having our child, we had, um, we were asked about the abortion scenario, right? Do you want the tests? And uh, I had to ask, like, okay, well, I wanted the doctor to say it, you know? what does that mean? You know, tell me what that means. Right. And she said, that, that, that means, um, you can decide what you want to do with your pregnancy. And I, and I said, like, mm, what do we want to do with our pregnancy? <laughs> like we're having this child. Right. And, um, then, uh, but God put me to the test, bro. Our first child born with down syndrome. And, uh, do you really love life? Is this an issue for you, Richard? Is this, um, is this, are you gonna let this happen? You know, my wife had worked for a, 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 a abortion, uh, sorry, a crisis pregnancy center. And um, the moment that women see their ultrasound, the decision is, is made. It's wild. I guess your wife has that same experience, right? Yes. And that's what uh, Amnion Pregnancy seeks to do yeah. is, you know, give give women free ultrasounds. Yeah. Um, oftentimes when they hear or see their child, yeah. the Lord uses that. And like you said, at times there's a, a refusal of the of the mother, yeah. um, you know, and it's a suppression of the truth, knowing that if I see and hear my child, I'll have to deal with the weight. But you know what, like you said, Richard, they uh, that this doctor actually offered you that as an option yeah. and they don't tell you what it's going to do to your soul or to the to, to the right. mother's soul that's right man. it's going to destroy multiple lives not just the the life of the child yeah now they've got to legally right you know and she actually said that she said i don't perform abortions for the reason of the potential of life that's what she said that's why it was wild for me. So it was a really interesting uh, uh, time in our lives. But brother, before we get up all in our feelings, right? <laughs> and people get up in their feelings and try to go off on us. Give us a quick biblical case for valuing and honoring life from conception to natural death. Just give us some, some, a few things here and there. I think the Psalm 139 um, passage is just... Um, so flooring brother Richard, yeah, yeah. um, and so strong, um, the, the, the knitting, the, yeah. the sewing together that were the Lord's needlework. And the question is, when does that needlework begin? It, it begins mm -hmm. up, up, immediately upon conception. Uh, and, yeah. and not to mention when it comes to reality, reality is, not just the way we think of things or see things, it's the way that God sees them. Right. And so David says in Psalm 139, 16, your eyes saw my unformed Unformed. substance, but it's literally, your eyes saw my embryo. Yeah. And then moreover, in your book, 
my days were written, written even before you formed them. Yeah. Um, and so it really comes down to the glory of God in, in the image of God. Yeah. And that's true of every single image bearer, no matter what. And so, brother, I praise the Lord yeah. for you and your wife's decision um, to give birth to this beautiful image bearer, your firstborn. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we also have the promise of God is the God of uh, the parents and the children. I will be God to you and to your offspring, he says in Genesis 17 to Abraham. And he is not the God of the dead, but of the living ones. That's right. That's right. And so when it comes to parents who maybe had a stillborn, like Johanna, mm -hmm. my wife um, was eight months pregnant when Johanna passed away and she had to mm -hmm. give birth to her and we buried her. Um, we, we, we have to trust that God is the God of not the dead ones, but the living ones and who's promised mm. to be the God of, of not only the parents, but of the children. And then this brings into view the fact that uh, childlike faith, considering childlike yeah. faith. And when you think of John the Baptist, yeah, yeah uh, John the Baptist was filled with the spirit from the womb. Um, and so the Lord is able to put saving faith and, and regenerate a child, even a child with, with, with um, great special needs yeah. um, as yeah. the compassionate, merciful uh, God of the covenant. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think of, you know, the concepts throughout the old Testament uh, of the fatherless and the widow, right? Hosea 14, three, for you are the, the God of the fatherless. You find compassion it says Isaiah 117. I just made a few notes here. Learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, and plead the case of the widow. Um, Psalm 82, defend the cause of the weak and the fatherless, maintain the rights of the poor and oppressed. God does this. His heart is, is there for the fatherless and the widow throughout the Old Testament. And then I thought this was a, this was a kind of a um, more recent uh, thought. John 14, 18, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. Bro, you need to make a write a song about the fatherless through the scripture, right? Until Jesus comes, he says, then I will not leave you fatherless and orphanless. I brought you into the kingdom of God. And when we undertake for the orphan and the fatherless, we reflect the gospel that Jesus has not left us alone like orphans. He's adopted us into the family of God. So one aspect um, of this, this whole issue could be like your, like your friends and, and your pastor friend, really standing in the gap to save babies so that they can be, be adopted by a family of God even, right? Like, like this song you mentioned. So tell us about that. What, do, what should the church be doing, being about? Should we be politically protesting and everything like this? Or tell us what we ought to be about, bro. Wow, bro. You make such a great point about adoption. And um, I'm seeing more and more uh, families and uh, Christians, um, a friend of mine, um, brother Chris Williams in Texas, grace and peace to you, K-Dub, uh, him and his wife uh, just um, announced in the last couple months that they're um, adopting uh, their first yes. child as uh, at this point, the Lord has not opened the womb for them yet. And yet that doesn't mean they can't have a child. Um, and so what they yeah. are seeking to do is reflect uh, God the Father's adopting love. Um, and they're just, you know, one instance out of a, a multitude of Christians that are seeking to glorify God mm. uh, by adopting children. And oftentimes it's even families who have their own children. You yeah. know, I, I had the great privilege and pleasure of doing ministry with uh, Dr. Vodi Bauckham yeah. um, at the end of January, early February, and spend a week with him. Praise the Lord. And our brother, uh, has nine children, several of them who are adopted. Uh, bro, you guys have you, you guys have quiverfuls, bro. I mean, serious. Praise God, man. <laughs> and so that is crucial. What a beautiful witness, Richard, to the the gospel of the glory 
of of adoption and by mm. the way i don't have a song specifically on fatherlessness as the main thing yeah. but we do talk about how we were orphans um you know spiritually at least my brother steven believe yeah. in steven and i have a song in the restoration project what great love is this yeah uh, bro. on adoption we got to check um, that out but yes the church must speak out and speak yeah. forth um but i would say um you know primarily as our witness uh, but not just outside the walls, inside the walls of the church through teaching, uh, but then for the church to be a refuge. And that's one of the blessings that yeah. Love Life Ministries has. They help equip churches to be a place of refuge for women who are considering or, or who have had abortions. Um, but then when it comes to the political sphere, yes, the Lord mm -hmm. calls us uh, to speak the truth. And we certainly should, um, you know, leverage and put forth everything we can humanly possible yeah. right. into helping our uh, society as much as possible have principles that uh, reflect the Lord's in the scriptures, yeah. justice yeah. and righteousness. Now let's dive inside the scriptures where we will define God's kingdom. It's his rule and reign and wide dominion from all times beginning. Genesis 1, God the king rules over all. Verse 16, for rule the Hebrew word used is Mashal. Yeah, see his kingdom order. Heavenly lights rule day and night, but over birds, beasts, and the fish of water. Yeah. God makes man in his image and the distinction right is this. So for time's sake, let's, I could, we could talk about this all day, bro. That's my issue, man. So, but I want to get into... Uh, you went to Westminster Theological Seminary, right? And so afterwards you wrote The Unfolding, or I guess during, right? I mean, it's it's kind of uh, tiered there. But tell us about that creative process, trying to rhyme in theological implications of Jesus through the whole Testament. How easy or hard was that, man? You know, because having already been doing lyrical theology, by the time I got to Westminster, you know, for seven, eight years, um, putting biblical truths and theology into rhyme form um, was something that um, I had I had already been doing for some time, uh, but I had some professors at Westminster really encourage me oh, wow. in cool. um, making the focus of my hip hop telling God's unfolding story, mm -hmm. and so it was super encouraging. Right when I got to Westminster in the first couple semesters, is some of the professors became aware of my music ministry. They said, Tim, you, you're, I can tell you really love biblical theology. Biblical theology is the discipline of seeing how God progressively reveals his story of salvation from Genesis to Revelation with, the, with an emphasis in, on, with Christ. Right. Why not tell that story? Knowing that hip hop is used oftentimes to tell stories why not tell the one unfolding story of redemption? And I was like, bet, I'm down, uh, let's do it. <laughs> and so even in my first semester, um, began writing yeah. um, for the unfolding. And so a, a year in, I had about two or three songs written. And then it became quite clear, I want to go all out and help God's people <laughs> understand right. uh, the way the Bible fits together with the centrality of Christ so don't God's go halfway, promise. write a book, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> well, I got to give credit to, um, um, in particular, uh, Jason, uh, Lamp Mode Recordings. Yes. He was uh, helping to steer the ship along nice. with Josh Wan at Lamp Mode Recordings. And Jason said, Tim, we want to leave a legacy behind um, that's more than music. You know, at this point, Lamp Mode has dozens and dozens of albums but we want to have um, robust uh, theological content that we can leave behind to generations yeah. to come. So with your album that you're working on, the unfolding and the fact that, you know, it's, um, it's meaty, it's rich, you're, you're writing it as you're in seminary, why not put it into a book? Yeah. And I was like, bet, great. I've already been putting the songs into Bible studies for certain internships that I've been oh, doing cool. in the local church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I took some of those Bible studies. Those were the early, early versions of some of the chapters of the unfolding. Right. And so little did they know it would turn out to be a 450 page book, which is the edited version. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just took a quick glance. I think it's 600 pages or something on Kindle. So uh, you got your work cut out for you when you read this book, man, go grab that. It's the corresponding book to the unfolding album. Go grab it. Cover is awesome, by the way, anyway. So um, just uh, just grab that and you'll be blessed for sure.
So um, let's jump. We're running just for time's sake. I'm going to skip a few questions here, but um, at Westminster uh, Theological Seminary, you know, the white hallowed halls, right, as it were. Um, how did how did you your backward beanie and hip hop fit into all that? Was that was that tough or was was that a, a real easy uh, easy fit? Good question, brother. It was not tough. God's people, including the professors, they greatly embraced me. Um, and there were, you know, one of the blessings of Westminster is one out of every three students at Westminster uh, is either from a different country or their parents are. Um, and there are many people at Westminster from urban backgrounds um, yeah. of, of, of various ethnicities. And so um, it was not challenging. In fact, I started at Westminster the same exact time as Brady Goodwin, a.k.a. the fanatic uh, from the cross movement, one of the pioneers of Christ-centered hip hop. Bro, did he go? Yes, the cross movement. Yeah, we started movement. at the same time. He yes. graduated a year before me. He's, he's a sharp scholar. Um, but what I, So it, 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 it went together nicely. And again, diving into Hebrew poetry and seeing, you know, yeah. at the end of the day, the Lord is the one who owns and is sovereign over every culture. And, yeah. and any good in each culture is really um, because of the image of God in that culture. Yeah. Uh, and the Lord can use these things to, to bring glory to himself and to have the, the faculty and the student body and some of the staff support my boss who runs the show in admissions and in academic affairs, Jonathan Brack. He was the executive producer of the unfolding album. Um, yeah, and, bro. And, and yeah, had, had professors um, kind of behind the scenes helping me with the book. Um, and so it was just an amazing opportunity uh, to have yeah. their support. I wanted to add, follow up on that. How does the regulatory principle then of worship within, let's say, Presbyterianism, you know, I'm not, I'm not a Pado Baptist, I'm Reformed, but uh, um, how does the regulatory principle um, fit into you know, hip hop particular? And I mean, can we do that? at like first press somewhere like uh, Timothy Brindle, drop a line. <laughs> is that going to work out or how, um, that unpack that a little bit? That's an question. And, you know, I think it's still up for discussion, up for debate and up for further exploration. What's really interesting is in Psalm 78, uh, you have a, a Psalm of Asaph. It's a teaching Psalm, a math yeah. skill, a Psalm of wisdom. And he makes quite clear that uh, it's a parable um, it's, it's written and you get the sense and scholars, um, for the most part seem to agree that Psalm 78 is one singer, one poet who's rehearsing the saving acts of God. Okay. And there's a sense in which he's leading in song. Now it's a rhyming song with meter, um, and, you know, with, with, with various instrumentation, um, but it might have been a solo singer who hmm. is leading and the, the, the people are listening and they're being edified. For lack of better words, it really resembles lyrical theology or rather lyrical theology resembles Asaph. I have a son yeah. named, named after him, Asaph. Yeah. It brings precedence to the fact that now I am not a huge fan of doing hip hop in church primarily for this reason. The fact that the scriptures seem to call God's people to worship the Lord together, uh, that the, right. the, the song should have a participatory Partici yeah. mm -hmm. aspect to it, yeah. where we're participating. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Edifying one another with those things. Yeah. And hmm. yet Psalm 78 maybe gives an argument for how, is there a time when, and, and I'm sure you've been to a church and I, I've been to Presbyterian uh, reformed churches where people sit back and listen and there's a singer in the front. Like and a call and she, response, maybe even. Maybe yeah. that too. Yeah. Yep. But mm -hmm. even a, apart from call and response, he or she is singing a song. Oftentimes it's in the prelude in the beginning to yeah. settle people's hearts before the Lord to prepare for worship, right. but they're singing a song and everyone's just sitting back and listening. Yeah. Well, lyrical theology, it could be used in the same way as a didactic teaching tool, yeah, a, interesting. A, a wisdom song like Asaph's in Psalm 78 to rehearse God's saving acts, to cause people to reflect on it and stir yeah. their hearts up in worship. And yes, maybe even have some call and response. Yeah. So, Bro, you need to be the regulatory principal guy uh, there at Westminster and kind of shake the tree a little bit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you that. know, a- another reason why I think I'm hesitant and others have been hesitant to make hip hop a, a big part of the worship, worship service. Time, yeah. The way it could take the focus off of Christ and put it on just one person. But nevertheless, a preacher who's preaching the word, if the song is being used to preach uh, God's one unfolding story of redemption, climaxing in Christ for the edification of God's people. So I've done it in, in PCA churches before in, yeah. in worship services. Um, and yet I'm not a person who is demanding it or insisting upon it. Right, um, right. And so... Yeah, g- great question, Richard. I yeah, think would, there's a lot more thought. There's a lot more to unpack it. there, bro. But that's True. that's something to think about. It anyways. I I want to think about it for my audience, especially because they're thinking about this. What do we do in worship? What do we, you know, is hip hop uh, allowable? I, I I went to a hip hop church crossover church in Tampa, Florida. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever been down there, but yes, a couple um, times. You know, um, they, they, I, I was surprised actually myself, they do hip hop and it's worship. It's worshipful. They're, they're actually engaging people to sing with. Right. So that's interesting. But um, now switching gears a little bit, what do you think the church needs right now in, in light of all these, let's say that sexual scandals right now, heresies abounding, bro, uh, worldliness, biblical illiteracy, persecution maybe coming from the U.S. Uh, situation at the moment, loss of religious liberties, et cetera, yes. critical race theory. I mean, you could go on and on. Right. What does the church need right now? What's your perception? Yes, brother, the perception that I have, and, and my wife helps me with this quite a bit, is that the church needs to be grounded, needs to be firmly mm-hmm. rooted in Christ. I think mm-hmm. that really summarizes it. This is Colossians 2. Uh, yes coming from uh verse six therefore just as you receive christ jesus the lord so keep walking in him by means of being rooted and built up in him and established in the faith just as you were taught and as a result abounding in thanksgiving wow. so being firmly rooted in your union with christ yeah knowing first of all being enamored with the glory of christ being, mm-hmm. being aware of all of the benefits, all of the privileges that you have in Christ. Forgiveness of sins, justification, sanctification, adoption, the Holy Spirit, newness of life, fellowship with Christ. You get Christ. You get suffering. <laughs> um, being super grounded in defending the faith over against these next verse. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty 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 deceit according to human tradition according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to christ so Mm. being able to stand against these not according to christ philosophies and worldviews some of which you mentioned bro i think that's what the church needs today richard bro just being grounded in christ and his word and and that's the way we do it you know we're grounded in who he is by by being grounded in what he said right yes um yeah, uh, bro, we're running out of time here, man. I, we could, I could talk to you all day, probably. But uh, let's do this. Uh, I'm not trying to trap you in beef, bro. But uh, East Coast or West Coast? You know, bros, absolutely <laughs> East Coast. However, it's got to be right. I have to confess. You know, when I first started getting into hip hop and rap music, um, late '80s, early '90s, I was, you know, living in Pittsburgh. I was really what happened influenced. to your Steelers this year. Sorry, bro. I'm so sorry, man. Yeah, that's another sermon for I, another, another day, bro. <laughs> um, I was very much influenced by West Coast um yeah. rap, in particular gangster rap, and then down yeah. south. And yeah, and then there was sort of my non-Christian uh underground conversion, hip hop yeah. conversion in high school, which became really into um rugged underground East Coast. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I will say. In, in the backpacker, uh, uh, lyrical heavy, yeah. um, uh, even secular uh, battle and intellectual hip hop scene, it transcends coasts. Yeah, sure. And so you would have crews um, and groups in the West Coast, artists in the West Coast, you'd be like, wait, he sounds like he's East Coast, but he lives in the West. Right. And then they would be like, wait, good hip hop isn't just, just East transcends, Coast. transcends, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it transcends coast. And then- right. Bro, when we went to Europe for our European mission trip, man, after Salvation in Christ, you know, decade later, yeah. we met Scottish, English, Dutch, 
African Dutch, Polish French, Haitian French, and African French just everybody hip-hop doing artists it, bro. for Christ. Just, just everybody for doing Christ. it, bro. Yeah. And so hip hop, yeah. man, is is international. Hip hop is being is every tribe, tongue, and nation. Sounds like a great medium for spreading the gospel to every tribe, tongue, and nation to gather around the throne of the Lamb. Look at so, that. And yet, just went Christ there. doesn't need it though. He doesn't need it. And so if hip hop continues to East Coast, West Coast, we need every tribe and nation, every ethnos needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and hip hop is a tool. Bro, I love your flow and your style and the sense of um, that underground type feel. Um, your music, the music, let's say, just the beats and everything, doesn't distract. It flow. It's 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 listenable, and then you actually can catch the content. Right? Some hip hop is. Uh, you know, you just can't catch it, right? And so I love, keep getting those beats, bro, that are s- so sweet, but still you can catch the content, right? So I'm, I'm just appreciating that, bro. Um, so uh, what are you listening to right now, bro? What's, what's hitting you? What are you listening to? What podcast, music? It could be just music, hip-hop, teaching, reading scriptures. What's hitting you right now? You know what, brother? There is not a ton of Christian hip hop that's hitting me right now, but I will say in the last year or two, my favorite projects uh, was Zay the Blacksmith's nice. Irons in the Fire. Um, I also really loved Hazakim's album Origins. Yeah. Um, so those are some of my favorites. I, I'm nice. a fan of my brother, Believe in Steven, his, his recent EP. Yeah. Um, and so, and bro, Alyssa Wade, her album, My, we need to uh, My get Father's on World, that, bro. We need you know, to get on amazing, that. Amazing, very worshipful, Alyssa Wade. So I liked uh, a beautiful eulogy uh, lately. Um, that's that's old stuff somehow, but anyway. So, bro, uh, Tim, my uh, my son was walking around the house the other day with a measuring stick. He was measuring everything, measuring this, measuring that. And uh, he uh, he went up to himself and he's like, hey, dad, uh, how much do you think I've grown in the gospel today? Wow. I was like, yes, sir. And I, and I thought, okay, this is a good time. This is a good opportunity right here. Well, Caleb, bro, tell me what the, what is the gospel? And so he says, he says, dad, the gospel is, hold on a second, that God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit are one. And that by believing in him, you can have life. <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's not that's it, bro. Um, I think you grew pretty good in the gospel. So Timothy, help us grow in the gospel today. Close us up. Give us the gospel, man. Christ is supreme. He he has the preeminence. And so I encourage our brothers and sisters, as you're reading scripture, when it comes to God's plan of salvation, it did not begin in the New Testament. It began in the Old Testament from the beginning, even in Genesis. And so I would encourage our listeners, when you're reading the scriptures, when you're reading a chapter, be reflecting and considering how is this passage, how does it fit in with God's one unfolding story of redemption are there any promises? Are there any prophecies? Or are there any shadows or types? Anything that God is using to prefigure his son? Because even Colossians chapter 2 talks about how these things that are the, they're the types, Jesus is the substance. Yeah. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs Christ. to Christ. And so if Christ is the substance and they're the shadow, the light of the glory of God shining on Christ, it's cast backwards into the Old Testament. So Jesus is not an afterthought. He's the one whom God the Father planned from all eternity, along with his Son and Holy Spirit, as your son nicely put it, as being the one who uh, sums up, heads up all things in himself. And so I would just encourage our brothers and sisters to be looking for Christ in the scriptures. And we can, uh, Luke 24 is very helpful for, for how to find or, or read the Old Testament with the Christ-centered yeah. lens and grow in your union with Christ. Look at all the passages in Paul's letters that talk about in Christ, in him, in yeah. the beloved, with Christ, through Christ, in the Son. Uh, and so on and so on and so on. Those hundreds of passages 
on in Christ. And that's who you are. That's your identity. Uh, and those are the blessings that God has blessed you with in the beloved uh, for you to live for him and glorify him. So that's, that's what I would love to close with brother Richard. Bro hitting us with the gospel. The gospel is the glorious news that Jesus Christ was a man died on the cross in our place a vicarious atonement for our sins in his own body. He bore the wrath of God in our place and by faith in him alone, you can have eternal life. And listen, that's for you. What we've been talking about today, what, what Tim just laid out in Christ, you can be in Christ by faith in him and him alone, casting aside your hope for your own salvation, your own works, you can be saved and in Christ. And so I hope that you, you make that decision today. If you've never trusted in Christ, you can do it. It's just as simple as that. Wherever you're sitting, wherever you're listening, just say, I trust Christ. I trust you, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of my sins. Put my faith in you. So we hope you do that today. But uh, man, my guest has been Timothy Brindle. Tim, tell us where we can find you, man. You could go to timothybrindleministries.com. Also, there's a Timothy Brindle Ministries YouTube page with some audio uh, blog devotions, and um, you can find sermons on timothybrindleministries.com, uh, as well as blogs written by my wife and some that we've done together. And so, uh, but Brother Richard, man, That's I praise it, God man. for you and your ministry, bro, and it's just a blessing to partner with you yeah, in man. this uh, podcast together today. Yeah, bro. Okay. Man, Tim, thanks for being our guest today. Um, Timothy Brindle, check all that stuff out. TimothyBrindleMinistries.com. Go over there, go buy his music, support him in that way. Go listen to him wherever you can. Yeah. Anyways, this is it, man. The finally came and we did it. So thanks, Timothy, for coming on. Blessings, Thank brother. You. Thank Thanks for listening for to this episode of Church Entrepreneurs Podcast. You can find out more information at my website at richardpmore.net. I also blog at richardpmore.blogspot.com. You're welcome to follow me on Twitter if you do that kind of thing. My Twitter handle is at richardpmore23. You can also email us at churchpreneurs at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. If you have any ideas for a podcast, any comments, questions, or Rotten Tomatoes, I'll take those too. Please reach out on one of those platforms. God bless you. Until next time. Gospel proclamation all across the nation. Well, this might seem like such a lofty statement. Did he read himself into the text? No, sirs. The Old Testament's about him on its own terms. So go learn and so turn. Until like his disciples, your hearts and your souls burn. And if you happen to ask the question, it doesn't just become about him after the resurrection. Yeah. The resurrection is the main theme of the whole Old Testament. Go, go check the script. The resurrection is the main